2014, out of the movement to protect communities from pesticide drift, primarily at the time from the agrochemical industry, um, Fern was doing that work before HAPA was even started, and um, so were some of the members of our board, um, folks living beside test fields um, exposed to pesticides on a regular basis. So I just want to say this is kind of a historic moment for us because even prior to the founding of HAPA, we've been working to get access to this data, um, fighting at the legis first at the county level and then the legislature, which Fern will share a little more about. But um, this is the first time we've actually been able to share the data. It only became available in 2019. Um, and we felt after all these years of struggle to get access to this information, it was really important um, for us to be accountable to the communities who are living beside the heaviest usage and to share whatever information we could glean from some kind of poorly reported data, to be totally honest. Um, so HAPA, we initially started to try and just push for some of these community demands that weren't being met um, at the county or state level. But what we found throughout the process is that the same forces of kind of moneyed interest in our government that make it incredibly hard to pass even basic public health regulations are not really unique to pesticides or agricultural issues. It's really, you know, different moneyed forces across a range of issues that really prevent good policy um, in Hawaii. So our mission is kind of broad. We work on a range of social, environmental, and economic justice issues, and we really try to help support community leaders who want to like grow their civic engagement and and amplify their community voice in those spaces. So without further ado, I'll introduce our community organizer, Fern Holland. Like I mentioned, she's been doing this um, before there were like organizations in Hawaii um, to do that. Now I wanna mention tonight also just to thank um, Hawaii Seed and Pesticide Action Network for sponsoring our dinner and helping to um, invite folks from um, the community to come out and to thank Mohala Farms for the wonderful food. Um, and I'll just also mention that in addition to um, HAPA, Hawaii Seed and Pan, um, in the, when we first got this data, it was really a mess. And um, the Center for Food Safety spent a lot of time just trying to crunch the data, put it in a consistent format. It was reported in all different increments. Um, TMK numbers were missing, so they did a lot of work on the back end to make it accessible. So just want to mahalo all those folks who have put work into this effort. Fern? Aloha, everyone. Sorry, I'm already loud, so I'm a little worried about this. But, um, so yeah, thank you, Annie. Um, I was born and raised on Kauai, on the east side of Kauai. I have a bachelor's of science uh, with a triple majors in marine biology and environmental science and wildlife management. Um, about 15 years ago, I got passionate about this work and I started working um, on protecting communities and the environment from the impacts of the largest chemical corporations in the world. Um, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to talk to this community today. I'm going to tab through here. So today we're gonna to be talking about restricted use pesticides that are used, um, well, around Oahu, but particularly on the northern end of the central Oahu corridor. Uh, restricted use pesticides are pesticides that are not general use pesticides. So general use pesticides are those that you can buy at the store. Um, they're stuff that we're more familiar with, like Roundup. Um, restricted use pesticides are not those kind of pesticides. They're pesticides that require certification um, both to purchase and to use. Um, and they vary from state to state. So different states register different pesticides as restricted use um, compared to general. And they are generally restricted because of the significant impacts that we know um, they cause, either to environment or to human health. Um, and so we're just speaking about those restricted use pesticides today. Um, so the reason that we're here and the reason that we're in this situation is that both the federal and state government has really failed to protect uh, the public interest and the environment when it comes to regulations around pesticides, restricted use pesticides. Um, and this is because there's a lack of independent study. Um, most studies are completed by the corporations to validate their own chemicals. Um, there's not a lot of independent study or regulation given the 
way that lobbyist powers are in federal government and even state government. And so because of the intensive industrial industry lobbying that we see happen, um, oftentimes regulations are created by the very chemical corporations that create the chemicals. Um, so we find a lack of regulation and protection um, independently and a failure for our government to do what is really meant to be done. Um, and also the lack of the precautionary principle in the United States. So um, in Europe and other countries, there's something that they call the precautionary principle, which is basically a cautious approach uh, to innovation that could have the potential to have harm uh, without knowing the full extent of the impacts or having that scientific knowledge first. And so it basically means that a chemical is approved for the market, but we really don't know what the impacts are. And then it's not banned until we can prove without a doubt that there's this incredible harm. Um, where other places in the world are more precautionary and more careful about what they approve and the research behind it. And these things have really led us into this system of a pesticide treadmill where we see us moving from chemical to chemical, but really staying in this concept of dependency on you know, toxic and synthetic chemicals. Um, like Annie briefly mentioned, you know, I've been involved on a local level in my hometown in Kauai um, for the last 10 years on this issue. I got involved when I moved home from college after a few years of really understanding this issue and being concerned and then making the connections of what happened on Kauai uh, with these larger chem global chemical companies. And, you know, I was born on the end of the Agent Orange test strips um, in Wailua. And um, when I came home, I started making a lot of the connections about the long-standing footprint that Monsanto had on Kauai. Um, and I also, you know, started to be concerned about some of the things that were coming out of Westside Kauai. So, you know, there were doctors that were concerned that we had certain birth defects that may exceed 10 times the national average. Um, I had three friends conceive children who were born with the baby um, intestines outside of the body um, within a one year period, which statistically is extremely um, unlikely to be an accident or um, just a random. And you know that was where my involvement really started and I helped to work on Bill 2491 with the Kauai community and a big network of us that came together to uh, write that county bill. And, that passed at the end of 2013, and then in 2014, Maui passed a moratorium on genetically engineered crops um, in what we call the Maui miracle, where they won by half a percent in the election. Um, and shortly after uh, Bill 113 was passed on Hawaii Island, um, we were pretty quickly sued in 2014 um, by the largest chemical corporations in the world, like Syngenta, um, basically sued the county of Kauai to invalidate uh, Bill 2491 before our bill would go into effect. And basically the bill gave us disclosure, it gave us full disclosure, what was being used, when, where, um, precisely, and it gave us buffer zones, so it would have given us 500 feet around schools, homes, hospitals, sensitive areas, and it also um, would have required an environmental study that looked at the collective impact of this industry as a whole. And that was, we were sued, and so they blocked that from going into effect. And then in 2016, um, the Ninth Circuit Federal Court ruled that because the counties of Kauai aren't implicably given the right to pass bills related to pesticides, um, that we should assume that they don't have that right, and they called it applied pre uh, implied preemption. Um, and that basically throughout all three county bills. So um, both Kauai, Maui, and Hawaii Island's bills became invalidated, and all of the pressure went to the state. And so uh, finally, after years of effort by many people, um, in 2018, we passed uh, Act 45, um, which was SB 3095, and that gave us disclosure to some extent. It gave us the information that I'm able to share with you today. Um, and that started to come out in 2019. Um, and that's kind of like the history of how we've gotten to this point. Um, the Act 45, just to be clear, it gave us disclosure, but we were also the first um, state in the union um, to ban chlorpyrifos, um, a very toxic uh, insecticide. And, and um, now actually it's been 
that's happened around um, the United States and nationally the pressure is on for chlorpyrifos as well. And it did give us a very minimal buffer zone around schools, 100 feet, um, during school hours only. Um, yeah, so that's the history of the state bill that led us to this data here. So um, where are these pesticides being heavily used? Uh, well, on the map here you can see basically Whitmore here and Haleiwa, uh, Waialua, um, and the red, the red indicates that that's a very heavy application um, there on that one parcel. And the Center for Food Safety, like uh, Annie mentioned, helped to crunch this data for us. It was given in a form that was so hard to um, use or transcribe or do anything with because it was in all kinds of uh, measurements, ounces, pints, gallons, pounds, et cetera. Um, and so they really helped to uh, organize that data and make it consistent into a unit of measurement, which we went with pounds, which is what California also reports in. And so this is just 2019 data. So this is all just the uses that happened in 2019. Um, and just while we mentioned California, I wanted to just say that California has the most comprehensive reporting um, anywhere uh, in the United States, they actually have very more geographically precise locations um, and in a way that reports so that communities can go on and just look for themselves. This took us years of trying to get this in a format where we could actually transcribe it to you in a way that makes sense because it just wasn't provided in that way. So just quickly to show you all of Oahu here, um, we have the various locations, um, not amounts, but just TMKs, parcels, that map the use of restricted use pesticides in 2019. Um, all of these gray dots here are schools, um, and you can see the amount of waterways, but we were looking really at the protection of our keiki in school um, when we worked on this. Um, this maps the combinations. So combinations are a concern. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but combinations are an extreme concern with pesticides because there's never been study about the impact of combining pesticides. And so when we have multiple restricted use pesticides applied in one area, we have impacts associated with each one of those, uh, but we actually have a lot of unknowns about what those chemicals do when they interact. And so. Um, you can see here that there's some parcels here that are darker. This one here, I'll talk a little bit about that. And some of these down um, closer to Mililani that have a lot of mixed use. So this is an amount of combinations of pesticides that are being applied. And then here we talk about frequency of application. So these are the parcels with some of the most frequent applications of restricted use pesticides. And you can see some of these parcels that I'll go through in a minute that are darker red are the parcels that have these very frequent applications. Um, frequent applications mean more regular exposure. More regular exposure means the likelihood of long-term chronic impacts compared to acute impacts. And so um, just to explain that a little bit, um, acute is a one-time generally strong large exposure that results in immediate or noticeable impact um, on a single time. And chronic exposure is long-term, low-level exposure that results in often different or uh, prolonged impact um, to human health or whatever we're looking at to the impact that we're talking about. And so incidences that have higher quantities um, of application are where we're worried about particularly chronic long-term exposures that might be less noticeable for some people because it's the acute poisonings. I accidentally you know, drank a cup, got sick, that massive dose that people are more familiar with. So that's the difference between chronic and acute and why we're concerned about long-term exposure. Um, what we found in analyzing just the parcels north of Wahiwa, so this section here is what we're gonna be mostly talking about today, your community. Um, we found collectively that there was over 200,000 pounds of restricted use pesticides applied just in 2019. I just wanna remind you, this is just a one year application throughout 2019. Um, 215,587 pounds, which is close to 108 tons of restricted use pesticides were applied north of Wahiwa in this section. 23 different restricted use pesticides used in combination 
on that area. Um, so very concerning. Um, we have, of these, we have 16 that are highly hazardous pesticides that are listed. It's a, a pesticide action network label. Um, and then we have 13 of these that are banned in other countries. Some of these chemicals are banned in as many as 58 countries. Um, we have four of these that are known to be carcinogens. Three of them are possible or probable carcinogens, and two of them are considered unclassifiable, as in we just don't know. Five are known reproductive developmental contaminants. Um, Twelve are endocrine disruptors. Uh, we had a combined total of chemicals that we know are endocrine disruptors, re restricted use pesticides, sorry, that we know are, are definitely endocrine disruptors at about 34,000 pounds. Um, an endocrine disruptor is a chemical that in interferes with the body's hormonal systems, so it can lead to a very wide range of effects. It can um, be often to male and female reproductive health. It can lead to human impacts such as diabetes, obesity, ADHD, metabolic disorders, thyroid issues, uh, developmental malformations, um, including those you know, in unborn children in the fetus. It can include cancers, immune and nervous system issues. And so a lot of our body is impacted by endocrine disruptors. Um, we are exposed to them in many forms. Restricted use pesticides and pesticides are one form, um, but there's many other environmental contaminants, both that we knowingly expose ourselves to and unknowingly expose ourselves to, um, that we're combining that then with the endocrine disruptors, um, such as these pesticides. Um, we are looking at these main people, organizations, companies, corporations, plantations that are using these chemicals. Um, and so you'll see, we'll discuss a little bit about um, Monsanto and Bayer's use near Haliva. Uh, Pioneer and Alum Farms are pretty much the largest users down by Waialua. Dole Plantation we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, Sugarland Farms, Alum Farms, um, some of the heavier users that we're identifying in your district. Um, we're gonna start with Dole Plantation. So you can see collectively in the red, these are the combined parcels and the TMKs that make up Dole. And so I kind of added those together, looking at um, these individual parcels, you can kind of see broken up here, um, make what, what Dole is reporting on. Um, obviously there's some very serious concerns with this area um, because of the distance and the close proximity to the communities here. So Whitmore Village, Wahiwa, um, Waialua, um, just only about a mile away. So obviously we're concerned not only with the community, but there's waterways that run through this system. You can see um, the waterways there running down toward Ranch Camp. And um, this is one of the most frequently applied parcels in Hawaii um, with 425 uh, applications in 2019 alone. So 425 different applications were recorded on these parcels um, in 20, actually on this one parcel, which is this heavier, darker red um, parcel there. And that's most of that. So one of the things that's the heaviest used on this parcel is um, what we're gonna call 1,3-D. It's 1,3-dichloropropene. Um, it is a fumigant. It's banned in 34 different countries. Um, they used a collective total of 177,782 um, pounds of these active ingredients um, or this active ingredient on those parcels that I highlighted there. Um, and this is a fumigant that's invisible. It evaporates very easily. It escapes from the ground. It actually volatilizes and escapes and can linger um, in the lower atmosphere, um, basically like, you know, above the ground, um, near houses, schools, businesses, uh, where people have the potential to inhale it. So that's where it's considered the most dangerous. Um, currently, it's banned in 34 countries. It is a groundwater contaminant. It causes respiratory and health impacts. Um, it's considered toxic if inhaled. It is prone to drift, um, and exposure can lead to headaches, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, in acute immediate exposure. Um, what else do I wanna say about it? It is also um, a nervous system impactor. So it, it impacts the nervous system in a way um, that binds with the enzymes that control uh, some of the nervous system processes and it stops them from working properly. So in addition to this almost 180, 
thousand pounds of 1,3-D. They were also using dia uh, diazion, um, hexazion, flutazoxanil, oxamil, and bromacil. And so these are the six chemicals that Dole reported using in 2019. Um, each of them, you know, related to different issues, m all like have toxic impacts to one way or the other. Um, we have, you know, bromacil, a probable carcinogen, um, oxamil, also, you know, very dangerous, toxic to bees, aquatic life, uh, another carcinogen, reproductive toxicant, aquatic to, um, are toxic to aquatic species, uh, groundwater contaminant, uh, possible endocrine disruptor with hexazion, less is known about that chemical. Um, yeah, so this is what we found about the use of dole parcels and some of the threats that are associated with these pesticides, um, like I mentioned briefly just then, is reproductive impacts, cancer, headache, nausea, vomiting, respiratory, nervous system impacts, um, and environmentally it is a groundwater contaminant, um, threats to pollinators and threats to aquatic life. If we look at the surrounding parcels around Dole, um, and really we could look at these in combination because they're all in that same location, but we separated out the users to uh, be more transparent about what's happening. Um, Sugarland Farms and Aloon Farms occupy these parcels surrounding the Dole parcels here. And again, extremely close distances to communities and waterways, um, you know, less than a mile uh, to Whitmore Village. So. Um, and about the same uh, to Wahiwa. So extremely close to communities, and we're seeing um, another fumigant used. So we have this 1,3-D being used by Dole, and immediately adjacent we have metasodium. Uh, metasodium was used, almost 30,000 pounds of metasodium was used adjacent, um, and that is already banned in two countries. Again, we have a carcinogen, that's a reproductive toxi toxicant, and is a suspected endocrine disruptor. And another one that's highly prone to drift. Um, some restricted use pesticides are more prone to drift than others, and this one, is, as well as 1,3-D, unfortunately, are both prone to drift, which makes them more dangerous for surrounding communities. Uh, we also had oxamil again. We have methamil already banned in 47 countries. And paraquat, which has gotten a lot more attention recently because of the connection um, to non-Hodgkinson's lymphoma, which there's a lot of uh, class action lawsuits you're seeing now around the United States associated with exposure to paraquat. Um, so they use 771 pounds of that one. That's a herbicide. And so today, just to be clear, I'm talking about pesticides as an overarching uh, category that includes herbicides and insecticides, fungicides, all of rodenticides, all the types of pesticides. Paraquat is a herbicide, um, and it's basically, like I said, linked to Parkinson's. It's definitely got likelihood of being a another carcinogen for other types of cancers, reproductive, um, toxicant, damages organs, um, hazardous to birds and bees disrupts the health and well-being of aquatic systems and also contaminates our groundwater. Um, so another very concerning uh, chemical being used in the community. Uh, again, we see the same round of impacts from a lot of these and we've added in Parkinson's disease and organ damage to this because um, paraquat uh, is, is associated with um, you know, Parkinson's but also uh, liver, particularly liver failure and um, issues associated with organ damage. The other pesticides that these guys used, um, you know, this is in addition to those four. They also reported using abamycin, bioremifrin, chlorotrinoprol, cyantroprol, silufrin, cyprobinil, lambda, diazon, nalid, permethrin, zeta, esfenvarel, and difluorobenzeron, and mamoxetin, I think you call it. So I, I did not say those all right, by the way. And depending on which country you are, you say them differently. Um, but I'm gonna move over to Waialua. Uh, Waialua is mostly Pioneer and Aloon Farms use. Um, and this is particularly concerning to me because of how close it is to schools and communities. And so we also see one of these parcels being one of the most frequently applied uh, parcels in, the United, in, in Hawaii. We have... Um, 401 applications in a single year, the 2019. Um, and that parcel is about one fourth to a half a mile from the schools in Waialua. So extremely close, 
uh, with very frequent, regular application. I mean, more than there are days in the year. Um, and so it, it is concerning that we see this level of application in such close proximity um, to these communities and also to the coastline. And so we see here that there's um, only about 400 feet from the closest parcel to the ocean here um, and the coastline. And all four uh, most heavily used pesticides that I started with on that first slide are all toxic to aquatic life um, and have the po potential to contaminate water. Uh, those other 15, I think it was, that I just listed, also some of those are as well. Um, but being only 400 feet from the closest application, it is extremely concerning. Uh, we also have, so I, we went through this again, the same, so we see paraquat used in this area. We see um, methyl mill again, and we see two um, nolid and permethrin starting to be used in higher amounts. And this was, this collective area here around Waialua had 15 different active ingredients, um, 16 different restricted use pesticides, but 15 active ingredients. And three out of four of them are known to be extremely toxic to bees, particularly. Uh, permethrin is really not well studied, so we don't know a lot about that, but it is already banned in 33 countries because of the concern with the impacts it has. And Nolid is an organic phosphate insecticide, which is actually shown to pose a higher risk to women um, and women's health. And the, the byproducts of Nolid and methyl mill both have the potential to drift to surrounding communities. They're considered um, the byproducts. So as the product actually starts to break down, it becomes more dangerous to drift and it becomes more likely to drift. And so obviously concerning there, we have the similar associated threats um, that we just talked about in the other parcels, reproductive, cancer, headaches, nausea, vomiting, respiratory, Parkinson's disease, organ failure, and then those environmental issues of threat to pollinators, aquatic life, and ground contamination again. Um, we did briefly start to look at Mililani because this one area made up of two parcels does seem to have very significant high use. Um, these are Sugarland Farms and Hartung. Hartung is uh, what used to be Syngenta. Um, Syngenta, actually all the chemical corporations since I've been here have um, changed names multiple times. Uh, but Syngenta was um, one of the co corporations that I've historically come up against the most because they're one of our biggest concerns on West Side Kauai. Um, and so I was interested in, in kind of looking at this, but I have not got a chance to plug any of the numbers of all of this surrounding farm area here um, to collectively look at what's happening in this area. So I'm not really going to dive too much into this, but these one particular uh, parcel that Hartung and uh, Sugarland Farms are using is in close proximity to the community. Mililani is only about a quarter of a mile uh, from Sugarland Farms, and we know that they're using metasodium as well. So that fumigant that I talked, the second fumigant that I talked about, um, and we actually know that metasodium can impact people uh, and human health a mile away. Um, and so here we have this quarter mile. Um, arguably extremely insignificant protection. And so just again, what we're seeing that the largest pesticides used on that parcel, it is uh, metasodium and paraquat dichloride. Sorry. Um, so it's the Mililani golf course is, is right here. And so this red outline here kind of covers um, what's actually two parcels collectively that um, Sugarland Farms is using. And so it, it runs, and I can show you after too. Um, we can zoom into the map a little and, and give you, I know it's kind of hard to, especially in the back. To, no, it, it's really small. <laughs> You'd be kind of crazy if you could see that back there. Um, again, yes, yeah, so we're just gonna tab through these. Again, we have the same associated threat, guys. Um, the same human health impacts, the same environmental concerns um, that we're so worried about here. I also looked at the Monsanto um, lots. So there's two parcels um, a, a little bit north um, east of Haleiwa that are concerned. Obviously, Monsanto historically has caught um, the most rap as, these, as one of the largest chemical corporations um, that does a lot of this research. Um, what we found with these two parcels is that there's surprisingly less um, being reported on this. Um, there's definitely areas of concern. Um, there's three restricted use pesticides that are toxic to aquatic life and bees um, that are surrounding uh, the Anahulu River and the Opaiula stream. 
and the wetlands north of Haleiwa. So obviously environmental concern there for some of that. And being so close to the coast, again, you know, 0.2 miles, um, Kawailoa, uh, 0.34 miles uh, from the coast here, relatively close to Haleiwa, and then these water systems that are running through into Haleiwa. Um, one of the things that's really important to bring up here is that um, while we see methyl mill and permethrin being used in relatively low number on these parcels, there's a lot of unknowns now, uh, particularly because of the exemption that's been given to research. And so I just want to explain a little bit that um, Monsanto and some of these larger chemical corporations that experiment with genetically engineered crops in Hawaii um, do so with exemptions to use pesticides in ways um, that exceed limits that are given on the label. So in, um, in law, the label of a pesticide is the law, and you have to follow that. But because they are given exemptions to experiment, experimental field trials are allowed to use a lot heavier um, applications and mixtures that you would not be able to, a normal farmer would not be able to do. Um, and unfortunately, um, that was made exempt from reporting under the previous uh, federal administration. And so we've seen um, a real question mark come up about what they're actually having to report because experimental field trials are exempt from reporting. And so we actually don't know if this is even close to the whole picture of what's happening on those parcels. Uh, we're still fighting for that level of disclosure. There's another reason that we don't know the whole picture, and that's because um, the use of neonicotinoids or systemic pesticides or neonics um, are not reported either. And so one of the largest applications currently um, around the United States and the world is really the application of neonics as seed coatings. And so they coat the seed prior to planting with the neonic uh, pesticide, and then it systemically is taken up by the seed and expressed throughout the plant in all of its life forms. And so um, those are exempt from the federal uh, pesticide law um, on reporting, and they're not even considered a pesticide. And so we actually have no idea how much neonics are being put in the soil, um, how much are being used, how much are being shipped in. We also don't know if the seed that is being produced in Hawaii is being coated in Hawaii with those chemicals and sent out. And so there's a lot of unknowns with these parcels surrounding Haleiwa. So I just want to explain that even though the numbers look low, um, there's more questions than answers about those Monsanto parcels. And again, we see the same kind of human and environmental um, threats. And so just reviewing, I'm just talking about the application of 2019 pesticides only north basically of Mililani in those areas that I talked about. And this number does not include that Mililani parcel that I was talking about. So this 215,000 plus pounds um, is really just those, those parcels um, north of Wahiwa here um, to there. Um, just gonna go. And so I just want to explain again, and I did talk about it briefly, but the, the real concern with the application of multiple restricted use pesticides in combination is every single pesticide has the ability to interact with one pesticide in a way um, that we don't know. And when you're combining you know, 23 different restricted use pesticides, the combination of impact is actually impossible to understand. And there's so many unknown unknowns and known unknowns that we deal with when we look at this data, particularly with combinations of pesticides. I also want to say that the caveats of this data, um, I want to you know, explain that I don't know how accurate any of this is. I, we've done our best to give you this information um, because the community has a right and deserves to know, which is what I've been fighting for for 10 years. Um, but it's not the whole picture. It might not be accurate. Um, this is self-reported data. So this data is reported by the ap applicator. Um, we have no idea what level of oversight there is on that. Um, it's only, I'm only calculating and looking at the active ingredients within a restricted use pesticide. And so you, you have a product, say like Roundup, the active ingredient is glyphosate. 
we're only counting the glyphosate amounts, or in this case, I'm using it as an example because people can relate to it, but the active ingredient is what we are calculating. We are not calculating the inert ingredients. So there's other ingredients inside pesticide formulations that are individually toxic as well, um, that have impacts as well. And so I just wanna be really clear about that part of it. Um, there's all kinds of reporting loopholes, and so I, I mentioned that about the exemptions for the experimental research technologies that are happening and around neonics, but there's loopholes that prevent um, data from being reported at all, and so that's not included in this also. Um, there's also the data limitations of how this data was actually collected and provided. Um, it, it, it's reported by parcel, which is very diff difficult. Like we, we show you the shaded parcel that it was applied to, but we have no idea where on that parcel it was applied. And so we're doing our best to kind of make um, a visual example of what's happening, but really we have very little idea of where these are being applied. And like I mentioned earlier, it's that geospatial um, detailed location that is needed about where this is actually being applied. So we don't know how close some of these applications are. Um, what else? The combinations. Um, I also want to just say, um, you know, as an environmental scientist, it's very important that I emphasize that correlation is not causation. Um, just because we can correlate some of this stuff, it doesn't mean that we can individually prove causation for certain things. Um, because correlation does not equal causation um, in chemistry or ecotoxicology. Um, and then there's all the regulatory failures, all the failures that we see on the regulatory side, health and environmental impacts um, from specific chemicals often take years, sometimes decades, before we prove without a doubt that this chemical is toxic. And again, this goes back to the precautionary principle of waiting until there's undeniable impact um, to then take action and protect people. And there's also a lack of previous data. So 2019 is the first year that we're seeing any of this reporting happening, and we simply don't know what this is compounding on top of after decades and decades um, of use. So I wanna be very clear that I'm doing the best that we can right now to give you a snippet of information, um, but there's all kinds of issues with this data and we're not sure how accurate um, exactly these things are. And so what kind of protections do we have in Hawaii? Well, very, very little, um, not enough. We have, like I mentioned, a 100-foot buffer zone around schools during school hours, extremely um, insulting <laughs> after fighting for so hard to get 500 feet and you know being sued and going through the, the entire battle. Um, it's pretty disappointing. And when we look at California, having a quarter mile around schools, a lot more meaningful and disappointing that that's where we're at. Um, we also have label requirements that differ from pesticide to pesticide, and uh, like I said, neonics are not included in any of this because they're not considered restricted-use pesticides in Hawaii, and then the seed coatings are exempt from reporting. Um, and then there's the experimental field trials um, of GMO crops and the fact that pesticides are really um, not included in that. So uh, we have pretty much no protection. And so where we're at right now with this is, you know, we're fighting for better reporting. Um, you know, we're also crunching the data from 2020 and 2021 right now, and we're awaiting the release of the 2022 data to give you a better idea of what's been happening more recently, because by the time that we were able to figure out a way to, you know, get all this information, the data um, transcribed and and adjusted in, in a way that we could map. This has taken a, a long time, and so this is old data, really. And so ideally, in the future, there will be a way where you can go and access what was applied, maybe even last week or last month or something, but right now, um, we're just reporting on that 2019. So we're in the process of working on 2020 to 2022. Um, we're working on getting better reporting. We need better reporting because this is simply unacceptable. And um, we need more community meetings. We need more opportunity for the community to engage and workshop this with you, because you know we're largely here to understand, you know, is this ed is this educational and helpful? And like, you know, where do we go from here? Like, where do you think we should go from here? Um, and we need to fight for buffer zones. We need to fight for decent buffer zones, at least that of matching California, especially with our winds and our systems that we have here. Uh, we absolutely need to fight for uh, buffer zones around um, communities entirely. And I want to say not just schools, but residences, mothers at home, you know, pregnant, 
um, kupuna hospitals, I mean, environment sensitive areas, you know, critical habitats. Um, we need buffer zones to protect important places. I mean, we need bans, but we need buffer zones as well. And um, we're gonna be working on that, and we have been for years, you know, uh, I've been, this is nine years on the state level, fighting for some of these things in the state capitol, which opened yesterday. Um, we'll be introducing and supporting measures around buffer zones, um, better land management in the future overall, and um, there is a measure that's gonna be introduced uh, around Malathion. Malathion has been particularly of a concern in the community uh, in this area because of a large spill that happened, um, and that is, we're gonna be pushing to have that restricted as well, because right now that's a general use pesticide, so there's absolutely no known data about general use pesticides. So again, all of this information is just restricted use pesticides. It doesn't include anything that's bought over the counter. It doesn't include anything that's um, you know, not regulated in that way. And so we have no idea um, combined with the restricted use pesticides what the level of general use pesticides are that are being used in the community. Um, but malathion is a particularly nasty one. And so we'll be working this year to get that restricted and that way we have reporting and better um, restrictions on who can and how that can be used. Um, and we need to fight for better data. So we're gonna improve the data. Um, and we, we also are looking at ways that we could get neonics um, registered also as a restricted use pesticide so we can start to collect an understanding and data about what neonics are being used um, in the community. Um, and you know, addressing the ongoing issues that we have with the Agri-Business uh, Development Corporation or the ADC, uh, which is responsible for a lot of our agricultural lands in Hawaii. Um, and we will be put, continuing to push for management that, of public lands that serves public good uh, rather than corporate interest and um, the liquidation of our soil and resources. Um, for you, the next steps um, really are to sign up and be engaged. I mean, we, if, if this many people showed up at our hearings, um, they might not be able to shut us down as bad as they do. Um, you know, we need people to come out and say, like, we want this, we demand this, we need this, and to share your stories. And, um, you know, so signing up for emails, staying involved in the alerts, and really following us on social media, um, giving testimony, contacting your legislators, um, contacting those in the community that um, you know you believe can help bring them to another meeting, um, let them know that this is going on, you know, spreading that community conversation and also really engaging with your representatives for whatever district you particularly are in um, and you know, working with community to also collect data. There's a lot that we don't know and we're all stronger together. So uh, we need to really work with the community to collect more data. Um, to learn more about what we do, about staying involved with HAPA particularly, who I work for, um, info at hapahigh.org. You can email at any time. You can also email me directly at fern at hapahigh.org. Um, and you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We do post our calls to action there as well. And there's a card up the front that has all that information. So um, please feel free to grab that on the way out. Uh, we're also on Twitter. There's also a lot of information at the front, guys. We, we printed out uh, pamphlets, educational pamphlets about those two fumigants that I talk about. So the 1,3-D and the metasodium. Um, back there, there's, there's flyers or uh, pamphlets of educational information about both of those to better understand what those two fumigants. Those are really the largest pesticide being used in your community. Um, the ones I'm most particularly concerned about and are you know, highly prone to drift, highly toxic, very concerning. And there's a lot of other information out there um, on the back table, so feel free to grab that on your way out. Um, but that's it from me, guys, so we're gonna open it up to questions. Yeah, Brandon, you want this? Yeah. You. I just wanted to know, you said there was a spill, and I don't know where that spill it was, or I don't know. Um, Amy? <laughs> Sorry, late introduction, everyone. Representative Amy Peruso which represents <clears throat> the community of Wahiwa, and now includes Mokoleia in front of uh, Waialua High School and beyond. So, Representative? So there was a malathion spill in 
uh, out in Mokolea, I want to say about a year ago, and actually the community organized, and the community came to me and asked for legislation that would add Malathion to the RUP list. So that's a, a really clear example of effective community organizing. Um, I know you've been talking about Wailua and Haleiwa, and we're up at Sunset Beach. And um, what I saw on the map, that at the top of the island, um, there was a pretty heavy red area. So I'm assuming that is Turtle Bay Resort. Okay, so I know um, just not too long ago, in the last couple of weeks, there, were, there was a, uh, some folks that had a horse farm next to the Turtle Bay, and some of their horses died. And I don't know if you've heard about it, if they're, you know, what you know, but I also have something else I want to say, too, before you answer that question. The other night, we were coming back from Honolulu and going um, onto the North Shore, and about four or five miles outside of Haleiwa, this, this side, I smelled something really strong in the air. And I've lived here 50 years, and so coming down that hill... And I have never smelled anything like that. I smell manure and, I mean, when there's cane there and pineapple. But it was a smell, and I reported it to the Department of Health, and they put me into the pesticide division. And I said, well, what should I do if I smell a smell in the middle of the, you know, it was like 8.30 at night. Oh, I don't know, call the next day. And I go, well, wait, how would you know what's happening the next day if it was happening in the evening? And so my thought is, for any of you that smell anything weird in the night, Call the police or call the fire department. At least it goes on record that you smelled something funny. But anyway, back to the, the North Shore and uh, the Turtle Bay Resort and the horse farm. And I'll address both of those as best as I can. So I actually did pull up the data for um, the restricted use pesticide data for Turtle Bay because it's come up about the heavy use. I've heard it before. Um, I don't have it open, so I'm, I'm not going to try to dig through it, but I can show it to you a little bit later. There are five different restricted-use pesticides that were reported on that parcel um, that are very toxic. Um, I don't, again, we have no idea what glyphosate. There's absolutely no record at all. There's no reporting. There's no documentation. We have no idea what's being used. Um, but some of those restricted-use pesticides are very dangerous um, to, to mammals and, and life on Earth. <laughs> um, and so it might actually not be glyphosate. I, I mean, I, I can't, I, I, again, correlation, I can't give you a causation, um, unfortunately. Um, but it is concerning. Um, you know, I know that there's concerns about um, both aquatic environments and environments around that area and human and animal health. It's just really um, almost impossible to to determine what killed those horses and if that was one of the restricted use pesticides. I do know that those are more likely than glyphosate um, to kill a large animal like that and it would have to be a very heavy dose, but I'm not sure exactly what that could be and I, unfortunately I can't answer it. Um, when it comes to uh, what to do, it's, it's very frustrating and very difficult that there's really not a response. I mean, in cases um, that I've dealt with on Kauai, um, they've tested air monitoring a year after the incident, a year and a half after the incident. So, um, you know, in some of the documentation that we received of violations, so pesticide violations, particularly um, violations of use, um, a lot of those are um, redacted. So about 50% of those were blacked out and we didn't know the, the situation that was violated. Um, but to actually get to that point is pretty huge because um, you know, our Department of Agriculture is hugely underfunded when it comes to this stuff. And so there's actually not, like California has a very high uh, funding amount for uh, the department altogether. And we see a lot more um, ability to, to in enforce, but we have very little enforcement. I mean, on Kauai, we had one person, I can't tell you how many times we called and we asked for help. Um, very few of those actually go investigate it. Um, I will say, that one of the things I learned in the first couple of years of coming home and, and doing this is that there's a, there's a product that they add uh, to the pesticides that actually smell sweet. Um, and it's, it's um, one of the chemicals that was called Big Bubble, and it smells like bubble gum. Um, and I, part of that is to make people less concerned about what they're breathing because, they, oh, it just smells like a sweet ca like candy smell um, instead of like a potent smell that would turn people off. And so, um, you know, do be mindful of that. I mean, it's, 
it's very likely that that was drifting pesticide, but it would, it's just there's not the infrastructure and the regulatory um, structure to, to really figure out what that is. And, and that's part of the problem and why we need better protections altogether and more controlled use is because we can't, we can't really determine that. And, um, you know, in the case of the Malathion spill, um, that was clear, like they, they you know, it was, it, but that's so rare um, that we get that. And because these uses are so regular and so um, common, it, it's, just, it's just extremely difficult to, to track that back. But I agree, I think, you know, the more times we call, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we don't know that people shouldn't do. Like one of the things, you know, I've learned in the last few years, that the state, the county, and all kinds of people violate all the time in our state law, our state um, 149A pesticide law, actually says that you, you can't spray a public walkway or a public area, like say around a bus stop or a sidewalk, um, without putting signs up that say, you know, this was sprayed, and this is any pesticide. This is including like glyphosate and general use pesticides. Um, you have to have a re-entry time sign. So you have to tell some, you know, so kids don't come run around and roll around the grass. The idea is supposed to be to give people the knowledge to walk on the other side of the path or to, you know, avoid that area for X amount of hours until it's mostly, high, you know, the, the worst period of exposure is there. And not to say that it's safe after that, but, you know, a lot of people do that and it's a violation of our state law. And so, you know, reporting that kind of stuff to the pesticide branch and reporting it as regularly as it happens. I mean, I've called many times about the county, you're breaking the law again, you're spraying where you're not supposed to spray. And it's like, you know, but there's very little enforcement and a lot of that has to do with the underfunding of everything. I want. I just, I just want to share my personal experience with this situation in California. When I lived there, I worked on the railroad and I worked across from lettuce, right next to lettuce fields. And one morning, early in the morning after a midnight shift, I was on the front of the engine because the guys inside were smoking, so I was outside. And the crop duster come by and let me have it. I was drenched. And the signs around those fields are don't come into these fields for 10 days. Deadly. Okay, so. As the weeks and months pass, I started to disappear, and I didn't know why, uh, because my brain was damaged in such a way that I didn't even know what the hell was happening to me. And it came to the place where I couldn't even go to work anymore, and the only thing that saved my life is an old girlfriend came to visit me, and they called my family, and they took me back to Indiana, and they were ready to commit me to an institution for life. And I found an organic chemist and a nutritionist that put me back together. But then I was listening to this doctor in San Francisco radio a while after that because I didn't even know what happened to me. I, my brain wouldn't allow me to remember that I had been sprayed because it was so damaged. And I was listening to Dr. Dean Adele on San Francisco talk radio and he was talking about pesticides in farm workers' conditions because of pesticides. And he said, he listed 10 symptoms that the farm workers were suffering over there. And eight of them fit me to a T. And the two other ones were more than likely my symptoms also. And he said that there are many, many, many farm workers locked away in institutions in California for life because they don't want, know what to do with them. So that's the bad news. The good news is that after I was healed, I came back and was driving to work and an apple farmer sprayed me. I called the sheriff, I made the sheriff come out there. They took me to the hospital, they took all my crows and threw them in a hazardous container. Container wouldn't let me even take my clothes, it gave me some kind of clothes to go back home. So if something happens to somebody, call the police. Tell them you don't feel good, tell them you wanna go to the hospital. Because when they took me to the hospital, like I said, they took my clothes and they put them in a hazardous waste bin, wouldn't even come close to them. And this was because I was sprayed by an apple farmer who just touched my car and windows. And I sued them and I got thousands of dollars. I didn't want it, but it's good. So I'm saying that things can be done. And this is a horrendous problem because if we don't stop this and it keeps killing our soil, there's going to be mass starvation on this planet. And I don't mean that to be something sad because the, 
the good news is we can fix this. We can grow food without this. So I'll stop. Good for you. So I just wondered if um, Governor Green has expressed interest in your work or what you can tell us. Actually, as a senator, he did. Um, he was involved in the passing of Act 45 that gave us this initial data, and he was supportive of these things. I think, you know, as a doctor, he knows the impacts of pesticides like better than even most people. We, we, we know that these are majorly toxic to human health. Um, I haven't connected with him about the legislative stuff coming down the pipeline this year. I don't know where he sits. Um, that was 2018. And, people and policies change. I'm not gonna speak for the governor by any means, um, uh, but I continue to light a fire under Governor Green to do something, yeah. Aloha, thank you for being here. Um, there's so many layers of what's going on um, and I would behoove you to connect with not just some of us in the audience, but there are other organizations that are also going to battle with this. Um, first of all, Whitmore is slated to have the food hub through ADC, well, other components, ADC bought all the land, um, and the different ag projects. What I would encourage all communities is to see what farms are connected with the food hub that is gonna be in your backyard because we very well know some of the f names that came floating out over the last three, four, five years have shown up in this data. Number two, we really need to think about why are these farms, these crop growers, using pesticides and insecticides that kill bees, who are the pollinators that create the food with the help of the plants, pollinators, all, why would food growers impact the free pollinators? Are they manually pollinating? Are they just simply GMO products? They don't need a pollinator because they can pollinate themselves, apparently. Although papayas, natural uh, Hawaiian papayas, they can because they mutate male and female, so that can happen. Um, It, it makes you feel that Hawaii should just maybe define what should be considered agricultural use of our agricultural land. If you're going to test things, you're not growing me food. That is not agriculture, that's science. Call it what it is. But don't take our native lands, and I'm not harping as a Hawaiian, but don't take the lands of Hawaii that can grow its own food without all these other things being put in. Don't tell me that you have to test your stuff. Take your stuff and put it in a, in a classroom. Put it in, in a warehouse. Do not put it in our land because our land is connected underneath. As you can see, Red Hill, the water, everything, it seeps through everything. And when you intentionally put it in there, that's the problem. Reparation, whatever they want to call it, they give millions of dollars, they go to the schools and they donate all these things. and that. that that's like the, the parent who doesn't come around except for Christmas and birthdays. Yeah? It's not a benefit to us. And I think we've been blind so long because we've been told we can't fight that fight because we don't have money. And what you folks have been doing and what continues and other groups have done is just show up. Because when we hold people accountable, like our our politicians, I won't say which ones, but our politicians, when you come to my community and tell me this is what it's gonna look like and this is what it is, and then you turn around and go the opposite direction because that farm person, oh look, they donated all of this stuff. Oh look at their workers, donated all, oh look at their board members. Yeah, so I think what we need to start doing is showing up in each neighborhood that has that kind of pollution taking it to your neighborhood board where these politicians show up. This is how I know about this meeting because I'm a member of the Laonani Valley Milani Malka neighborhood board. 
and Amy did her report and shared it. We, this is where we have to be. You know, I live in Laonani Valley. I'm a Waihoa girl. I traverse straight through to the North Shore, and I see it, and I question it. But if it's just me, just you, just you, it has to be a bigger scale. And we need to start putting our alliances, our different organizations together, because Rooted here and started the conversation several years ago, and that's how Dole got called into play about things. That's how the, the legislature, those passing the money behind somewhere, got called to the table. So we're not, we're not blind anymore. And we're not afraid. We don't let the bigger person, the big man, speak for us. And bringing you here, that's perfect. Because when we try to go and hold hands and go somewhere, nobody's listening. And I'm not trying to sell a product, but <laughs> Um, I, I am a distributor for Purim um, Health Products, which started in California, and we actually introduced the first two of the people products here in Hawaii. So I'm very proud that we brought that. There is one specific product that we make that was targeting glyphosate. 76% in a, in a double-blind study, 76% of glyphosate was removed after using this product. Our developers, our founders, they, they it's not about the money they will find all the farms. They come, they love Hawaii. And they're sad that our little place like this looks like that. And so I know the rest of you here are, are, are ready to get on board, but this data, that's gotta be something that we can go and we can spread it around. But for us, like Mililani, so I live in Mililani, well, Tech Park, but I sit on that neighborhood board. I wanna know where that is. Because I see where the new turf company is behind, uh, in behind, up behind Safeway in that back, they're just starting. What are they gonna start spraying? My girlfriend and her family, they used to work for Monsanto. They were poisoned in Waialua. The struggle that they had to go through and lose their jobs in their, their homes because they had to fight the bigger fight. And Monsanto can change their name, but we still know who they are. But that's why I'm saying they think we're stupid and we're not. But these are the things that we have to look at and we have to, we have to remember when someone comes to our neighborhood and says, hey, we wanna do this and we're gonna bring all of this and we're gonna give you all this money, we gotta remember that what they've already done. And it's not just here. I drove through, I drove through Olamana, that's ag. Those acreages of homes where all those mansions sit, that's agricultural property. They're supposed to have agricultural activity. Oh look, I'm growing cucumbers that qualifies for ag. So Amy, whoever is on the, whoever's the committee for agriculture, I think it's important. Our people don't own any land because people are coming over and buying all the land and we can't grow anything. Look at ADC, they were supposed to give it to small farmers. They didn't give it to small farmers. Small farmers showed up and say, okay, I'd like to get a parcel. Oh, sorry, maybe next one. So I think the, I'm glad the conversation is starting but I think it's really important that we look at legislation and really defining what is agricultural practices, not science experiments. That is not helping feed me. And just real quick as a piece of information, Representative Cedric Gates now heads up the Agriculture Committee, if I'm not mistaken. Cedric Gates, G-A-T-E-S, he's out in Everside. Please, capital.hawaii.gov, you can find him on there. Look for your legislature, le legislator, and he's there. Hi, my name is Mitchell. Uh, I live here in the community, but I work down at Wailoa High School, and I, n I never worked at any place that I've seen so many dead birds. I'm always picking up dead birds. Now, Pioneer, they say, I heard rumors that there is a seed factory that sits right above the school, okay? I know an old man, uh, Mr. Santiago, he had five goats, all had two babies each. He tied them along the fence line. At the end of the day, he went back, and all the goats was dead, including the babies. But Wailo High School near the gym, there's a pump house. There's an underwater brackish water that they use to pump out on the field of the football field. How much effect does that have on the community and the kids? Like I said, boundaries, buffers, 
What is that? It sits right on the border. That's all I wanted to tell. Hey there, Fern. Thank you for the work you do. Um, I guess my question, and you might have answered this earlier, um, is that broken down into what landowners, are those private lands, are those lease lands? Um, and then what of that land is compromised in our food production? Is it all just GMO seed corn or is the stuff that we're finding at the supermarket that is a part of this local initiative to grow food, are those heavy chemicals being led to us? Uh, thank you, Daniel. So yes, um, those products are a mixture of uh, experimental field trials for corn, um, but they also are the Sugarland Farms and Aloon Farms um, are what you see when you see Hawaii grown uh, in the store. If a lot of that is Sugarland Farms, um, so y you know I've noticed that in Costco recently um, on Kauai because I read everything, um, 15 years of this work, I can't really buy anything without figuring out where it's from. Um, but yes, I, I'm concerned about the level of use, particularly on Sugarland parcel, um, with those 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 RUP active ingredients um, that are being sprayed in large amounts that end up um, on the counters as local food. Um, so, so definitely. What was your first question, Sidian? Okay. Yeah, so I believe that the parcels, we do have that somewhere, and I, I did a, I, we talked about the users, not the owners, so thank you. Um, it's a combination. We see ADC land, a significant amount of our state crown seeded lands um, being leased out to chemical corporations. I mean, historically, we've dealt with that a lot on Kauai as well. The entire Mana Plain is ADC. Um, state land and, and that entire plane is where the bulk of our fight has been on Kauai and you see that here as well So it is state land um, ADC leases particularly around Whitmore here and Dole um, some of them uh, some of those parcels are privately owned I believe um, and um, Kamehameha schools, I think is responsible for some of the parcel leases uh, around Haleiwa um, but I could, I could dive into that a little bit more for you and, and pull that data out for, for what those, we, we mapped the TMKs, particularly in association with the ADC, because we were trying to figure out last year when we tried to reform the ADC, um, you know, how much of this is happening on state land and, um, and, and you know, the public use of land, um, you know, for the public good, not chemical corporations, experimentation, science. Um, and, and so, you know, it, 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 it ebbs and flows, but the bulk of it, unfortunately, is state seeded crown land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I answer your question? You, you, you did. I mean, I just want to say, you guys, if these are state lands that these chemicals are being applied on, then it's our fault. Yeah, 100%. This battle has been going on. So, stolen that. Stolen that. Yeah. yeah. But it's us in the Public land. There's a couple of questions that I think were anonymously dropped into the bucket, so I just want to make sure that we acknowledge that as well. Um, so the first one is, are the large plantation owners, uh, landowners responsible to clean up the land of pesticides before or after selling the property to other people? And the answer is no. 
um, it should be, um, it makes reasonable sense um, that they should be responsible. And, and we've actually discussed um, with Rep. Peruso and, and others in the past about how we could pass a measure that does require that um, any, anything that is crown seated, you know, state, whatever you want to call it, land, um, is, is, res is returned um, from after its lease in as good or better quality um, than it was given to. I mean, this whole concept of being able to take land and use it in liquidation, kill the soil, kill the water, kill it dead, you know, and then walk away is co obviously completely unacceptable. Um, but unfortunately, it's not a thing yet. Um, what is the status of the pesticide ban at public schools? Um, that was an agreement with the DOE to not do that, and we're not sure how much that is being enforced or, or whether it is at all. Um, how m have they maintained the grounds organically? Um, there's really no oversight of whether that's happening or not. Um, the, the, the pesticide ban at public schools um, was a result of bringing uh, Lee Johnson here and touring him throughout Hawaii. He's one of the most famous cases of somebody that um, beat Monsanto in the lawsuit um, about his non-Hodgkinson's lymphoma, which is basically directly connected to um, a spill exposure where the, the backpack ruptured and poured down his back, a huge amount of herbicide. Um, and he was the first case that actually won. And so he came to Hawaii and he met with the DOE and they agreed to do this, but whether there's any actual enforcement of that has been pretty null. Um, and then will the colleges and universities in Hawaii also become pesticide free? Again, um, we have no idea whether that's actually being implemented or not. And uh, th there are groups that are kind of dedicated to that. There's been a pesticide free campus um, and there are you know, conversations about that, but the truth is, is that we don't just need a memorandum of agreement. We need a law and we need people that enforce the law and ensure that it's actually followed because the truth is, is that people can voluntarily say whatever they want, but the truth is, is it rarely happens. Um, herbicide reporting is only done if it's a restricted use pesticide. So this question asks, what about herbicide reporting? Um, if it's a general use pesticide like glyphosate, it's not gonna have any reporting at all, but if it's paraquat and it's a restricted use pesticide like some of the examples I listed today, um, it will be supposedly recorded accurately in this semi-decent, horrible reporting that we have. Um, <laughs> this was a, a joke question. That we filled it with. Um, the stream that flows into Kayaka Bay is unmanaged and constantly dirt and silt is flowing into the stream and the bay. Uh, what agency is responsible for this stream management? Uh, I think this is largely county uh, regulation that you would call your, your county government, um, but, but it should be, so what? And state who, what department? DLNR, okay, yeah. And deal, I mean, call everybody. Call your the mayor, call your council members, call the actual, you know, county, yeah. yeah. Call everybody. You can, you, can start with, you can start with Senator Brenton O'Hall. He's, be oh. Yeah. Call, call, call. Um, okay, so that's all the questions that were dropped in the box. I just want to wonder if you're aware of and if people in this room are aware of that the wonderful folks at some big corporation are about to release 400,000 a week or something GMO mosquitoes in Hawaii. Yes. It's going to be into the billions. It can't be a good thing. And so make yourself aware of that. Make people aware that you don't want it to happen. There is a petition around. I don't know how to tell you to get it. But this cannot be a good thing. And you can actually Google that because it was on the news the other night. They had a protest. Sorry, that it's too close. They had a protest. If I'm not mistaken, it was on Maui because they were getting ready to release the mosquitoes. I saw somebody. Hi, my name is Katie Metzger. I'm a beekeeper. Thank you so much for all the work all through the years. I really appreciate it. I have apiaries in Wailua and Haleiwa and Sunset, and um, I have seen the result of pesticides, um, thousands of dead bees, <laughs> sweeping them up, and then the next day seeing it again in Wailua in particular. And I actually moved all of my bees off of the property, moved them to Sunset, 
and then move them back later. And I went around just in the neighborhood and I found some um, farmers and spoke just personally because I've learned that, you know, approaching people um, in a non judgment judge, judging way <laughs> goes, um, is the first step to meet them. And I did meet a very elderly woman who was growing beautiful flowers. And she, we spoke about how she, <laughs> she, loves, she loves her grandchildren and she loves the earth. And she was telling me how she didn't want to do anything to hurt the bees. And um, she talked about what she used. And it was a neonicotinoid. And they are systemic. And they do kill bees. Um, it's proven. It's they're, they're banned in the EU. Um, and I, we talked about it, and we talked about her using it, you know, less, <laughs> and not to put pesticides on flowers when they're in bloom and in daylight hours and all those things that before I never would have even considered, but I feel like we have to meet people and have the conversations. Um, and it's actually gotten better in that neighborhood, and I've, because of this meeting, I want to go down and speak with her and, and give her the update, because now she's sort of part of this coming around, part of bringing her into the fold and saying thank you and you, thanks for listening to me. Um, I also want to say that the youth matter. Their voice matters so much. Um, I would love it. There's eco clubs in all the schools and I so appreciate when they show up to these meetings. We need to invite them more because they listen. Our, our, our legislators listen to them as they should because you're all inheriting what we are doing here. So um, just to put that out there, whenever we have these meetings, if we could you know, put it out to the schools, I know that it would be, um, that the students would, would fight for this too. Um, thank you for doing that. And I, there's one thing I forgot to mention when we talked about um, you know, how do we move forward? Like I'm, you know, I am an advocate and a lifelong activist and so, I'm all about like bands and this, but I appreciate your ability to meet and have those kind of conversations. And I think part of what we need to do is really support the farmers in general um, to figure out a way to move out of this system. And so, you know, there's been a lot of regenerative agricultural conversations and measures and bills that have been moving forward that really help to shape the future of agriculture away from this pesticide dependency. And so, you know, that is part of it. And meeting, meeting those farmers in the, and saying, okay, how do we get you away from this addiction to whatever it is? Or how do we wean you down off this and move you into a more regenerative system? Um, and supporting organic farming, supporting those farmers that do it the right way that are, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can give farmer support that helps farmers transition out of this toxic system. It's better for them. It's better for their product. It's better for their product line and their profits. It's better for, for the environment, the community, it's better for everybody. And so um, we do have to come from a place of how do we work together and how do we move us out of this toxic system, you know? So many plots in Eva area and also in Wailua that have been opened up um, for all these uh, young farmers to lease the land to just specifically for ag, and it's awesome. And I don't think a lot of them are aware <laughs> about what's going on around. And it's really cool to be farming, and I love it. And like, the, it's, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm seeing that those conversations, a lot of excited, energized people, but I feel like they're not aware of some of these larger, heavier issues, and I feel like they would bring a lot to the table, and um, so I'm excited about the opportunities there to reach those people. Aloha, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Hamamoto. Um, I'm with Mohala Farms. Um, I just wanted to respond since um, you mentioned the farmers and the support for them. And so I just wanted to take this time to introduce um, myself and the people that work with me. So just you may wonder who are we over here on this side. And we're the ones that help uh, prepare the food and bring the food over. Um, <laughs> Kathy Maddox is the cook. I've known Kathy for a long time. Um, so we started Mohala Farms back in 2005. 
um, down in Wailua next to um, what you might call Thompson's Corner. Um, and the, some of the people that are here that help grow the food and prepare, harvest it, prepare it, are here as well. And this is Savannah. This is Zach and Lydia and Molly's over there and uh, Jose is over there. So um, as depressing as this subject is, well, I, I shouldn't say depressing, but um, thank you so much for all that you've done and for your presentation here. Thank you for, thank you Mary Lax for helping to organize this and to, um, and to get the word out so that we, you know, and, and inviting us to, you know, prepare the food. But um, it's really good information. It's a wonderful community meeting. I'm so glad to be here. And um, I am really hopeful about the future. Thank you. And actually, I also just wanted to pivot off of what she was saying about our youth. Um, and please forgive me, because I know you, I love you guys to death. But there is a group called Rooted. And tonight, <laughs> I'm not going to make you talk. But we have, the, we, have, we, have, we have the brains and the body and the foundation of Rooted right here in Miss Brandy coming over from Kauai. Maui, sorry. Some of you was from Kauai, Fern from Kauai. But they not only came over for the opening of the legislature and Onipa'a and some other things, but they came tonight to support. And her daughter Jasmine here, whose feet, whose blood, whose everything is grounded here in Whitmore, she is young enough to be my daughter. And this is the youth that we want to support. So you see Rooted, go on Instagram or Facebook, Rooted KMKA, follow them when they have things, when they speak, when they present what they're doing in our Whitmore and in our Kihei, in Kihei and Molokai. This is grassroots, just like Hapa. This is grassroots. And th these organizations, Hapa, our beekeeper, this is what we need to get behind and collectively together go forward to support this kind of work and to do what um, Brother Daniel said. It's, it's because of us, this is our fault, that the state has control of what they do. So support these groups and thank you so much. If you could just stand up real quick, just, uh, just Randy and of course Carol over here too and Jazz. And of course, also with them, we talked about him before we introduced him, Uncle Francis and Nancy. Because that generation, we are losing. We are losing our kupuna. And we are so grateful that he takes the time to share with all of us. And of course, with all the youth that are outside also. I saw you, Anu, out there. But it's because we have kupuna like Uncle Francis, who's willing to share what they do and it's not gonna kill us, it's not gonna poison us. So, um, anybody else have anything else to, okay, Kathy, right? Yes, yes. Hi Fern, thanks again for your work and for the data, it's really informative. I wondered if you ever were able to find out how many GMO testing sites there are throughout the island chain. <laughs> Mary, what's that last number we have? So, 1,308, and that was 2014. So that was the last time that a lot of that was collected, and now it's exempt. So we don't actually have a lot of that details, but um, that's come up recently again. Mary and I have worked together for over 10 years on some of that stuff, and just adore her, by the way. But. Um, yeah, we need that data and we need to, I believe somehow we need to get that from the DOA and that's on my list of things to do this week is find out from the DOA 
if they're still reporting that because on the federal level they exempted a lot of that stuff. Um, but I know that in the in the report that came out from the 2014 data, it came out in 2015, um, that did show us as far exceeding any other um, state, Illinois and California being the, the follow-up for experimental uh, permits. Um, but to be clear, that's not um, an application, that's not a block, that's a permit for a, a particular uh, genetically engineered test trial. And what I found when I reviewed those reports that are almost a decade old um, was that they were doing at the time a lot of uh, dicamba tolerance uh, tests and different herbicide tolerance because glyphosate and Roundup was moving away from the, um, it was moving into uh, like the, the weeds that the resistance and the, they weren't, wasn't working. And so they were working on new herbicide tolerant genes um, and they do a wide range of tests. And you know, unfortunately, um, as we see these corporations do less experimentation in Hawaii because they know that we're watching and because the community marched on every island in 2013 and came in hot in 2014, um, they've started to actually, especially on the west side of Kauai, um, seem to be lowering that number, um, but they're growing very rapidly in Puerto Rico. Um, and so while we shuffle this project to another community that arguably even has less ability to defend them and protect themselves, um, I'm constantly conscious of this because uh, while my priority is Kauai and Hawaii, um, in this work that I do, um, this is a global problem. And as we shuffle these experimentations into the third world and the global south, as they call it in Europe, um, we kind of move this impact around the world. But um, we don't have an updated number from that number that Auntie Mary just mentioned. Yes, Repres Russo. So I have an ask before we end this evening, and that is um, a little bit of support. So I've been working with HAPA, and um, I'm so grateful for them, I could cry. Um, but uh, we are introducing legislation this session, and we will have um, five, six bills on pesticides. And we're introducing them in the House. So Representative Gates is carrying a bill um, that will increase the fines for people who break the law. Right, so it's not just a slap on the hand, it's not just the cost of doing business, it's really important. So when he hears that bill, which he will, which is the only, like that is why he's carrying it, so that he can hear it as the chair of ag in the house, um, please support him. Please show up, please give testimony. There are four other bills. Um, the first is to um, amend the list of RUPs, as I mentioned, to include malathion. The second is to include um, the definition of RUPs to include neonicotinoids. Um, we also have a bill to create uh, pollinator habitat on all UH campuses. I'm the chair of higher education, and I thought I would use that power that way. Um, and we also have um, a bill to help FERN, so to increase the reporting and improve impor uh, reporting. Um, and um, what? Oh yeah, buffer zones. So the big ask is the buffer zones. And we were going back and forth, quarter mile, half mile, quarter mile, half mile. Um, and I think we landed on half mile in the language of the bill. It's a big ask. Um, and we cannot do any of that work without you folks. We can't even get it heard in the Senate if we don't get some pressure on the senators right now to ask one of those senators to carry pesticide bills, any bills relating to pesticides. I have until next Wednesday to file those pesticides bill, pesticide bills, and I can't find a single senator willing to introduce companion bills. Not a single one. So I'm asking you, and here I'm doing it in a public forum, which is probably not very po politic of me, but um, I, I'm asking you to please connect with whoever represents you in the Senate, whoever senators, like whichever senators you have relationships with, family connections to, um, please ask them to consider introducing at least one bill on pesticides because we have so much work to do and this is such an urgent issue. Um, and, and you know, our buffer zones bill, it's, it's just half a mile around schools and hospitals. We are not even talking about residences. So it's not even, it's, it's a half a step, right? But just to take that half step, uh, we really need the community to come together and, and to reach out to the people you know who are sitting in office. So that's my ask.
Is there language to, or leeway to include language? Um, and this came up because Alun Farms had the buy the box kind of delivery, and they had an organic box. And I called the president of Alun Farms, the son of the owner, and, um, and I asked him, I said, oh, did you get an organic farm somewhere? Oh, it's on this section, on the non-organic farm? That box got moved real fast off the internet because I called him, I took, and I found stuff on, we don't ever take the kids to Pumpkin Patch. Eat, I stay home with them if they have it for school, whatever it is, because I found a pesticide brochure that was used for their ornamental, all the little itty bitty pumpkins and things that are cute and you buy them and decorate your house the amount of stuff in there. But the biggest thing, I don't care what was in there, it's pesticide, I don't care. What it said was do not use in uh, low water table areas. Guess where a loon farms is? On the lowest part of the water table in Kapole. That was a bigger problem. And I found it in their field. And they said, oh, we don't use that. Oh, so somebody brought it in on your field? So that's why I'm saying if there's way to put language in there that if you are using it, and you're gonna sell it or you're going to lease it, you're required to put in your documentation that this land is contaminated because then you have these young farmers, oh, I get this little lot, I only have to pay $20 a square foot, great, I'm gonna have an organic farm. But they're grow. maybe if we can, and I'll figure out what senator besides our own we can talk to. And I, I just wanna emphasize also to, to your point, there's a lot of violations that we simply don't know are happening. Um, and that's because we don't know what's being used. And so that was part of like when I came home after my science degree and I'm like, I'm gonna come home, I'm gonna help Hawaii, get back to my community, you know? And we just hit this brick wall. Like for years we were like, we can't figure out what they're spraying. Like, what do you mean we can't figure out? If we can't figure out what they're spraying, I don't know what to test the water for because you can't just randomly test water. You have to know what you're looking for. You have to know, so a lot of this and, and I, I could spend my life just going through this data, to be honest, but the, the, and finding things, you know, like last year was the, 2021, excuse me, because we're already 2023, was the last year that chlorpyrifos was allowed to be exempted and used in Hawaii. Um, and so it's gonna be interesting to see, you know, if, if that comes back and reported next year. I mean, I'm, or, you know, the, the, the problem that we see with this kind of stuff is that people find out a chemical is going out and they stockpile it. And so, you know, we, we have like layers of issues, but a lot of the problem is really not knowing where the violations are. I mean, like I said in the, in the presentation, the label is the law. And on the label, a lot of these pesticides say, can't be applied in winds over five miles an hour, can't be applied within 200 meters of a water course, can't be applied within, and it goes on and on and on. And we have absolutely no idea um, it, where or when that's being followed. And to the point about the violations and the fact that we simply, we, we smell these things and we don't know, it's all part of that same thing. There's very little enforcement. And so, and, and we don't even know how many people that are applying are reading the label or can read the label or understand what those dilution measures are. And so there's so many ways that the label could be violated and without proper reporting, without accurate, mandated, proper, clear reporting, we're unable to ever find those violations. And so that's a big part of, yes, we need to increase the fines, but we also need to be able to identify when violations are happening. And if we only have one person on each island that's willing and able to go do that, we have a, a serious staff shortage. We're unable to do what our requirement, the basic requirements to protect human life and environment. Okay, we only have a few more minutes. So I'm gonna take one question from Brandy and then from Rex. Okay. Um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, TJ. Thank you, Fern. Thank you, Hapa. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Thank you, my rooted Ohana. Um, and everybody who are here, I want to know, you, you mentioned uh, soil testing, water testing, and also we want, um, we are looking for buffer zones. We have been trying to get a buffer zone around the Whitmore community since we started this. 2018, I think, um, and we still, I mean, we're having to fight against, you know, or fight or deal with ADC, which has not been very easy, but um, we'd also like for help for from everyone, if you would like to have a buffer zone behind your home and you live in the Whitmore area, because we're still trying to do that, whether Amy's bill or the bills aren't gonna include 
buffer zone, I mean, residents or not, we still are pushing for that. And um, we have asked Hoppe for help, and um, Amy, of course, has been helping us. TJ has been helping us um, in the past, and hopefully more in the future. Um, but how can we, what can we do now? Like, if we start to collect soil or we collect data, um, a lot of people in one certain area, they all have diabetes or they all having headaches or they all, you know, the acute or the long term. Either way, you know, like we want to be a part of that or, you know, we want to start on that. Thank you, Brandy. It's a very important question. Um, so two things, environmental monitoring, soil, air, water, extremely important. Um, you have to know what you're testing for because every individual test is a certain amount of money and it adds up really quick. Um, we need, you need to hire an independent consultant that's trained at that. That's actually what my degree is in, like environmental monitoring, I have a major in that. Um, but it, you need, like I couldn't do it because it would, <laughs> it would throw out the whole trust or the other, it's like my bias is obviously there. But you, you know, you need to hire a consultant and have them test, you gotta know what you're testing for, you gotta know what you're looking for. And every single one of those things um, has to be done in a specific way. So depends on what chemical you're looking at and the fate of that chemical. So if a particular chemical is more likely to volatilize, you're more likely to catch it in the atmosphere, in the air, and in the wind, and you have a certain window of which you can do that. Um, soil, you know, certain things, when we soil sample, you have to like preserve immediately so that it doesn't break down in the time, um, you know, it's not half-lifing and, and disappearing by the time it makes it to the lab, and that's the same with water quality testing, depending on what we're testing for. So there's a lot of rigorous um, methodology and, and steps that need to be worked out before you just kind of like go out and, and do that kind of stuff. But it's super important and that's one of the conversations. We, it's, you know, it's definitely something that we've talked about and, and creating, yeah, and collaborating to do that I think is really important. I think that's one of our next steps in all of this. Um, and as is the, okay, so buffer zones, absolutely fight for buffer zones every way that we can in the legislature. If they will voluntarily back off, voluntarily get them to back off, that's, it's all helpful. The, the, the emergency thing is protect your families, protect your communities, protect your animals, protect your, you know, the, your sensitive environments. And to do that, we have to fight across the board however you can. Um, and so after um, the Waimea Canyon Middle School was evacuated multiple times in the early 2000s, um, our children were passing out, fainting, tearing up, um, there was two incidences, and despite Syngenta um, claiming that they weren't spraying that day and a teacher taking footage of the spray truck going by the louver windows at the same time, um, they went through this whole spin thing and they tried to say that it was a plant, Clionia gyandra, or stinkweed, um, which was making the kids pass out. So we, you know, but they voluntarily abandoned that field, and so they haven't grown in that field immediately behind the school since. Um, just simply because of the public outcry. And so I think that while I feel often very defeated, 10 years in, still trying to get disclosure, still trying to get basic buffer zones around my communities and my friends, I still feel like the pressure and the more that they know you're watching and the more that they know you're paying attention and that the more people show up, the more they kind of voluntarily, so to speak, back up. Um, there was a, something else, you, you said monitoring and then you said Oh, epidemiology, okay. So um, the other thing that we're working on right now with a couple of different universities is uh, getting somebody that knows about data analysis um, to overlay census data with some of this information. And so um, again, correlation does not equal causation. Um, and in science, it's almost impossible. It's very rare, like Lee Johnson is a very rare example of where you can say this cancer was caused from this exposure. That's extremely rare in science. Um, but there are um, statistical analysis that can be done that shows that the probability of 80% of the people in a specific community having a specific thing, asthma, this, that, the other, um, could you know, is a, is a major red flag that this is statistically impossible. Like in the case of my three friends from the same town that all had children with gastrochesis in the same year, um, being one in three million something, my friend at MIT crunched the math and said, 
on the basis of a Hawaii, a Kauai population, about 70,000 people, um, that it was statistically impossible for three people to act, you know, s randomly come up with this majorly rare birth defect. So there are important things, and we're actually in the process, and we had a meeting this morning, actually, I had a meeting with some people that are, we're gonna team up and, and work on that kind of stuff, and that's the next step of where we can take this data, but um, by the time we, get this old data and we get this stuff it's, it's just it's frustrating for me because it's like you know we're, we're looking at this old data we're looking at this old information and we have to wait until enough people in our community are sick um with a specific thing before i mean it's 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 totally unacceptable um so that's that's i hope i answered that thank you fern you've been so informative i just wanted to say that a few years ago at the north shore neighborhood board we invited the head, the director of the Department of Agriculture, Scott Enright. And he was in with that organization or that department for quite a while. And this whole pesticide issue came up again. And he was defending the corporate farmers. He was saying, well, they follow the rules on the pesticide. They don't spray them, blah, 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 only a little bit of this. But he, as you addressed, at one point, they're spraying, spraying 30 to 40 of these chemicals at the same time, and you don't know the interaction and what it's going to create. So just know that you know our government's supposed to be supporting us and taking care of us, but for some reason, it's not. So anyway. I hate to do this, but time is running short. So thank you again. The Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action. Annie, Marie, Jasmine, thank you guys all for, for doing this. And to all of you, um, we do have contact information um, cards back there for HAPA. And if you want something specific, stop and talk story with one of us and let us know that you, know, you wanna get in touch with us later. So thank you very much everyone and uh, go home safely and we'll stay in touch.